All righty. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to it. It's the video and video interview edition or continuation of the audio edition of the Daily Daily Caller podcast for November 8th, 2019. I'm Derek Hunter. I'm your host. Thank you for listening, clicking, tuning in, subscribing, spreading the word, all those good things you're doing. We only grow because of you. And as we do because of you and for you every Friday, we bring somebody into our world so that we can pick their brain and learn a thing or two. And this week is no different, except for that it's even better. Last week was David Limbaugh. He was, eh, just kidding, David. But this week we have Tom Fitton, president of Judicial Watch. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Derek. I love David Limbaugh. He he gave me crap for 45 minutes. I can give him a little crap uh, now. Um, First of all, I want to talk about Judicial Watch because they do the Lord's work in a lot of ways that used to be the journalist's work. They file the Freedom of Information Act requests. They dig into the records. They're doing you're doing actual reporting that used to be done i swear at least i remember it that way maybe i'm misremembering my child it used to be done by journalists describe what the work of judicial watch is and why you think it is that the journalists that have you know gigantic budgets i mean for god's sakes the new york times still has a dance critic on payroll they could get somebody to file freedom of information act requests but they don't why is it that the journalism has stepped back from doing journalism well they do they do still do some journalism some in New York mostly Times, by Washington accident uh, I think in the coverage of the issues that we care about uh, judicial watch does much more significant journalism as traditionally defined uh, than the New York Times or the Washington Post I think a lot of what passes for coverage of the certainly the scandals of the day is basically gossip Mm-hmm. You know, this person says this about what happened, as opposed to kind of documentary evidence and and uh, well, just which to is make like up we, a name, a, a guy named Adam Schiff will call up a, a Maggie Haberman and just say here, and then stenographer away. Yeah, just that, like, that's just that's just leaking. Right. And uh, now, you know, I, certainly sometimes there's those, value in it. Sometimes there's some public interest in that. Uh, but these these organizations have really the veil's been lifted. We've always recognized liberal bias in the legacy media, uh, but now they've exposed themselves and they've kind of come down on the side of uh, becoming liberal advocacy groups that sometimes commit journalism. <laughs> and Judicial Watch is a group that uses the Freedom of Information Act. We're a nonprofit. We're an educational foundation. Uh, we sue in court to get access to the records, and then we tell people what's in the records. You were show. filing FOIAs during the uh, the Bush administration. We were filing FOIAs during the Clinton administration. <laughs> I started at Judicial Watch in 1998. So I've seen Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now President Trump. And uh, in many ways, transparency has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and the deep state under President Trump has kind of gone off the deep end in terms of uh, uh, in ele- illegal secrecy. Uh, but Judicial Watch does more FOIA and more FOIA litigation than anyone out there. And uh, certainly we do litigation to stop government abuse on behalf of real whistleblowers uh, or aggrieved taxpayers and other people wronged by government misconduct. But uh, there's no one getting more information out about the scandals of our day uh, than Judicial Watch, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know about the Clinton email scandal. Right. Much of what we know about the Obama abuses of the IRS is because of our work. Benghazi. The only reason you know about Trey Gowdy is because we uncovered uh, smoking gun material out of the Obama administration about the cover up of Benghazi uh, that led to the creation of, sele- of the Select Committee on Benghazi, which in which uh, Mr. Gowdy made his name. And uh, certainly with RussiaGate, we're getting all this information out that certainly this Congress is uninterested in getting because they're more geared toward overthrowing the president than doing traditional (laughs) oversight. Before we get into the overthrow or the attempted overthrow or attempted coup, that every bombshell just turns out to be a dud. I want to just linger for a second on what you talked about, about the discovery that you guys did during the Obama administration, because it was incredible. And I I am somebody who's been a, a media critic. I've written about it for a number of years. I wrote a book about media criticism. And you see the way that the left media covers it. You guys discover it. They have no interest in it. They passively mention in information uncovered by the conservative judicial watch so as to pour salt on it. 
And then they go back to ignoring it. So when you point out to a Washington Post reporter, you guys didn't really cover the uh, IRS scandal very much. They can say, well, look, in paragraph 17 here, we dismissively said the conservative judicial watch found some information on Lois Lerner and move on from it. But that information in the 90s, I remember the late 90s, judicial watch was very effective in getting information about the Clinton administration. Now, you did that through the mainstream media. You guys have found a way to circumvent the liberal media and get it out there to the public. You have 7 million people who follow you on social media. Um, the evolution of Judicial Watch is when you started there to now, how has the evolution of what you view as the mission? I mean, you're the captain. You're the Captain Stooping of Judicial Watch. <laughs> Meryl Stooping over there with hair. Yeah. And uh, pretty good hair, too, by the Thank way. Thank you. But uh, describe how the mission has evolved. And, and was it through circumstance that you just saw the media pull back and so you had to step up? Or was it through we're going to overtake them? Oh, we're in it, we're in it to win it. We're, you know, we see a threat to the republic. And so what we're doing is thinking of every way we can to get the word out about what's going on and to address the problems. Uh, it's not a radical redefinition of the nature of our work. We've always been doing Freedom of Information Act work. We've always been suing the government over misconduct. It's just more and better of it. Uh, you know, in the Obama administration, the Clinton administration, I think we sued them maybe 20 times. Bush administration, 40 times. Obama administration, 400 times. <laughs> and certainly we were at those numbers even under the Trump administration. You know, to our liberal colleagues and friends out there, I dare say there's no one suing the Trump administration more than Judicial Watch to get access to government information. And uh, now we have the opportunity to kind of get the material out directly to the public through social media, uh, through uh, new, newly rising media like the Daily Caller. We certainly, we actually represent the Daily Caller News Foundation in a number of cases. And... Uh, you know, certainly Fox News has been an a innovator in terms of getting information out. But uh, it's, the media doesn't even, it's not even a question of just barely covering our work. They just completely ignore it. Mm -hmm. we, you know, Derek, we've had material come out in the last two months <clears throat> that would knock the socks off of any traditional media expose. And it, I mean, a memo by Andrew McCabe documenting discussions of wearing a wire on the president of the United States. Just this week, um, I think it was in partnership with the Daily Caller News Foundation, documents showing that a Obama State Department official was talking to the political chief of the Russian embassy, seemingly about Christopher Steele and the Fusion GPS Russia Gate smear. Of course, it's classified, but that was what the request for, was for. Give us documents about that. And that's what we got. So, you know, it seems to me there might be some public interest in figuring out what the Obama gang was doing with the Russian embassy a month before Trump was inaugurated and how it ties into Russiagate. Uh, but no coverage in any of the mainstream media. Hillary Clinton could be deposed within weeks on uh, her emails and Benghazi by Judicial Watch. Zero coverage in, in the mainstream media. Uh, but certainly if you're following us on the Internet uh, and in you know alternative media, as I point out, like Daily Caller and other groups, uh, you would know about it. And, and frankly, I, I, you know, that's nothing to shake a stick at. Was, is that the metaphor? Uh, you know, that, that's significant coverage these days right. because, you know, the New York Times is uh, uh, completely off the rails in the Post and many other organizations in terms of just uh, it's all about destroying Trump and not about you know, just doing basic journalism and fair coverage. Well, there really are two worlds now. And let's talk about those two worlds as they come together. We've had this secret in the bowels of the Capitol building pseudo impeachment tribunal down there with Adam Schiff shouting down Republicans who are asking questions that they don't like or refusing to call witnesses that Republicans would like to depose. Now that show is going semi-public next week. They're going to be public hearings, sort of a, a redo of witnesses they've already spoken to that Democrats, I assume, feel comfortable with. The big vote in the House the other week was portrayed as this is 
This is what the White House wanted. This is what Republicans wanted. They wanted the ability to call and question witnesses. They wanted the public to see it. So we're moving in that direction. But actually, uh, examination of the rules tell a different story. Adam Schiff is still God. He still gets to overrule anything that he does. He's, he runs the show. So talk a little bit about the disconnect between the way what's happening and what we can s expect to see next week is being portrayed, uh, the disconnect between that and what really is going on. There's no due process for the president. <clears throat> Uh, this is an impeachment inquiry by their own admission. The president isn't allowed to call witnesses. He's not even allowed to be present, has his aides and uh, top policy people are being questioned about White House deliberations and deliberations with foreign leaders. So not even classified information, which would be typically come up in those discussions, is being protected. Uh, it's just extraordinary to me. And so... Every coup needs a show trial, and the show trials will begin next week. So there's no due process. It's just a witness coming in uh, that uh, they think they can be used as a cudgel against uh, President Trump. Uh, it's not respectful of the, I think, what the founders intended, which was a respect, uh, w which is a uh, a process that respected the executive branch, respected the choices of voters, uh, and. I don't think the founders or uh, current day American voters think that the impeachment power you to be used as a political weapon. Uh, you know, the more you look at that impeachment, and I, and I encourage people to read the transcripts of what co has come out, read the news stories, but just read it with a bit of a jaundice eye. And what struck me about it is the coup is corrupt. It's abusive. It's a threat to the republic. It's all of that. But when you look at it, it's also kind of boring. It's kind of petty. Yes. Because there's not much there. you got a bunch of bureaucrats worrying about what Ukraine policy is for six weeks, engaged in rumor mongering about what the president want, did or did not want. Uh, and, you know, some of them complaining, one ambassador complaining she was being pulled back because she had lost confidence. The president had lost confidence her, in her, which is not unusual nor corrupt. It's not illegal. The president can fire an ambassador because he doesn't like the way their glasses sit on their nose. The president's exercising his core duty as uh, the, the uh, commander in chief to conduct our nation's foreign policy. And there are bureaucrats sniping about it. Like I said, it's, bet it's petty and boring. So this is this is not the basis, good faith basis for an impeachment. And, you know, as I think about it, I think the Senate needs to step up and say, we're not we're not playing this game. There's not going to be an impeachment trial. It ain't going to get out of the, you know, we're going to strangle it in its cradle, uh, this coup. Uh, so don't think that you're sending it over means that we're going to give it any, uh, we're going to give it the respect it's due, meaning it ain't getting a trial. Because that to me would just be doubling the abuse on the presidency and the republic as to give this coup the time of day in the Senate through a full trial. That's kind of what Lindsey Graham is sort of talking about now. Mark Levin has talked about preemptively just declaring that we're not, unless it, under this process, we're not taking anything up at the Senate uh, that the House sends over. Mitch McConnell has a slightly different view. There's not going to be a conviction. We'll do it. We'll do it as quickly as humanly possible. But yeah. yeah, you know, the leader, uh, Majority Leader McConnell seems to be circling <clears throat> around the issue and right. kind of laying the groundwork He's tough to nail down. for it. Squirrely for a turn. Uh, but certainly they've moved off their original position that, oh, there's the trial's inevitable. Lindsey Graham is suggesting otherwise or yelling about the process in a way that would, I think, give them some uh, wiggle room. I, I think politically they're worried probably about – Senators uh, Collins, Murkowski, and Romney not being there to support shutting it down even before it gets out of the gate. How can an impeachment inquiry go forward when the man chairing the impeachment inquiry is technically a material witness for their interactions with the so-called whistleblower and Lord knows what else? I mean, at some point, we should be able to ask some questions about Adam Schiff, for example. Where is the Russian collusion you guaranteed? If you're sitting on this information, now would be a good time to come out with it because Robert Mueller, 35 or two years and $25 million, couldn't find it. Um, but he could well have been involved in the concocting of a lot of this, yet he's now in charge of it. 
Well, that's right. And uh, to be more specific, the leaker communicated with Adam Schiff, may have conveyed improperly information he wasn't allowed to convey, which was classified. Which he shouldn't have had in the first place. Well, it was argue- conveyed to him by somebody else. Right. And so we don't know whether he should have had it to begin with, which also needs to be investigated. Then he communicated outside official channels, outside the law with the, with the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Schiff's staff. Schiff was briefed on it, but then he lied mm-hmm. and said otherwise. Multiple times. When probably. asked about it, uh, and he repeatedly, as you point out, so it raises questions about the whole genesis of the investigation. And, it, you know, in any ordinary investigation, he'd be conflicted out. But it's the House. And uh, under under the Constitution, uh, the House can do what it can get it with, role, yeah. do what it get its way with. But on the other hand, you know, impeachment doesn't overrule the rest of the Constitution. And the president deserves due process. And uh, there is a quasi judicial aspect to this process. And the president, I think, uh, would have a chance in court at least to try to get himself involved in the process There's and protect also precedent, his interests. Precedent, which this town, in large case, especially the judicial branch, the, the the legislative branch, insists you follow precedent when it comes to courts. I've seen footage. I remember the Clinton impeachment. You were involved with Judicial Watch back yeah, then. Yeah. David Kendall, the president's attorney, grilling Ken Starr about the Starr report. He was David Kendall was president's attorney. He was not a member of Congress. No such shot at that. No even possibility of that under Schiff's rules. I have to say I am shocked, Derek, by the what seems to me for, as an outsider with the collapse of the constitutional defenses uh, by the administration. That the White House is not defending the president's prerogatives here, both as uh, I guess individually, I guess you have his private lawyers do it. Uh, but the president's got interest in uh, his deliberations, uh, the sanctity of his deliberations, uh, foreign policy, the ability to conduct foreign policy, to protect classified information, all sorts of executive branch prerogatives which are not being protected uh, and which could be protected if he was at least participating legally in the process. So this is kind of a loaded question, but do you think that, considering the nature of the work that Judicial Watch does in trying to bring things to light, but do you think that the president made a tactical or strategic mistake in declassifying the whistleblower report and the transcript from the call because of the separation of powers issues and the seating of authority and and too much? Now, because as soon as that came out, Democrats started saying, well, we want to see more transcripts. So we want to see more call. Uh, should he have held the line at that point? I don't think so, because he certainly is educating the public. I, I, as I said, there's, this is the impeachment about nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that transcript has helped uh, develop that. Um, and I've often, often observed that it's the Alice in Wonderland impeachment. A verdict first, evidence never. Right. So I don't really think anything he could have said or done in terms of making documents available or anything else would stop the impeachment train. So, you know, in many ways, you know, I'm complaining about the collapse of the constitutional defenses. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the fight would have been used against them by the shift crowd because they're, they're currently saying that any lawful objections to our subpoenas is an admission of guilt. Talk about star chamber I know. proceedings. I, know. Not I mean, to, give it a, to call it a witch hunt is a slur on the witch hunters. But they also <laughs> I mean, have they, a situ- they were, At least they had, the, they, they had a legal process when they were going after the Salem witches. <laughs> well, Here, there's no whether even, or not she can float isn't yeah, much but, of Yeah, one, but, but uh, there's, not even the, there's not even the patina of a legal process here. This, we, is just, just, this is all just power politics. Well, you have the situation where the Democrats want to subpoena the president's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. What any communication between those two would be privileged. This president has been so abused uh, that no other defendant or citizen would have had to suffer through in terms of having his attorney-client privileges violated, uh, his being spied upon, people around him, his family being spied upon, uh, just being targeted by these bureaucracies and law enforcement in a way that you know no one else would have been allowed. No one else would have been targeted in such a way. And if they had been, the government would have been brought to heel by the courts or the political process. Here, all bets are off. Because it's Trump, the protections of the law don't apply and the Constitution doesn't apply. Look, the president's not above the law, 
but he's not beneath the protection of the law. And by saying that there's got to be restrictions on the government or the Congress's ability to upend the republic doesn't mean you're above the law. It means that the Constitution's got to work here. And there are separations of powers and there are rights the president has as president and as a citizen. And just because you want to go on an impeachment jihad, it doesn't mean you get to burn down the rest of the Constitution to do so. Republicans, though, you said the phrase that I think describes a lot of Washington since the election of 2016, because it's Trump, because it's Trump. A lot of Republicans are keeping their powder dry, keeping their they're they're keeping away from it. They're giving it a wide berth. They don't want to be directly involved. U.S. senators are kind of Mitt Romney will go to a camera every once in a while and say something stupid. But aside from a Lindsey Graham, there doesn't seem to be a proactive group in the Senate willing to come out and preemptively call garbage when they see garbage on the other side of the Capitol building. Aside from a a Devin Nunes or a Jim Jordan or a Mark Meadows, this is an opportunity that most politicians would never pass up they could make a name for themselves here, right? A lot of us remember the House managers from the Clinton impeachment. Lindsey Graham is a United States senator today because of his role in the Clinton impeachment, the prominent way that he presented himself back then. Yet there doesn't seem to be that. Most House Republicans want to avoid this. And is it... Part of this, a failure, there's unity. Yes, when the vote comes, they go, they put their card in, they push the button, they run away back to their offices and and back to their districts. But is there a failure to really fight against this, fight back on this, rather than just playing defense on the Republican side? Yeah, there is uh, generally a lack of leadership. Uh, There aren't enough Republicans taking an aggressive tact here, but it's nothing new. Uh, There are many politicians here in Washington, and you think, you know, oh, you're a senator or you're a House member. Think of the opportunities you have to protect the country and advance the public interest. And that horrifies many of the elected officials in Washington. They they consider this to be kind of – they'd be just as happy being a town councilman or mayor of a small town. Uh, They have a very limited view of their roles as elected public servants here in Washington, D.C., and it would, it's horrifying for them to take a forward look, to take a leadership position on these core corruption issues. Look, they didn't do anything on Benghazi. They didn't do anything on Hillary Clinton. They did virtually nothing on Russiagate. I mean, it's been uh, uh, some adolescence out of the Republican-controlled Congress, largely. And uh, the highlight people like Nunes and Jordan and Meadows... Uh, frankly, is you know, it, it's those are the exceptions that prove the rule. Because the fact is, you can only name five or six right. people. I know. I on either side of the, the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, I can't know. go any deeper than that. You know, Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson sending the letters out. Beyond that, what else is the Senate right, been doing? Sending a letter. They, you know, what else has been? It's what else auto been going written by staff. But this is this isn't. A, I can't impress upon everybody enough about this, though, Tom. This isn't about Trump. This is about the presidency. These are precedents that are being set, that if Democrats, they, they're not naive enough to think that this will be the standard they'll be held, that will never be held to this standard, right? I mean, once you break that next barrier, once you basically on inauguration or before inauguration day, start unleashing prosecutors to crawl through the colon of every aspect of somebody's life, using the power of Congress to start questioning every single decision and demanding every document, you can't get that genie back in the bottle. So to think Republican House, Democratic president, President Elizabeth Warren, God forbid, but President Elizabeth Warren would face this kind of scrutiny. Do you think as somebody who you know talks to these people, testifies before Congress, goes in the media, do you think this occurs to them or do they really live in a world where there's the rest of life, the rest of history, then there's the Trump administration, this weird anomaly that afterwards on the other end of it, we can go back to the way things were? <clears throat> Oh, I don't think the uh, Republican leadership that the uh, on the Hill is going to do anything differently but, um, than they've done you don't in the think past. So? No, no, and the Democrats recognize that. Right. And why would they be afraid of this? None of them have been held accountable for the abuses of President Trump. You had this massive spying campaign on the presidential candidate. They were talking about overthrowing him as president. 
Uh, where's there been accountability? Hillary Clinton's never been prosecuted. Justice Department has essentially ratified the uh, Comey criminal cover-up. I don't mean, I, you know, I didn't mean, a, a, well, you know what I mean by that. Right. The cover-up was criminal. Right. Uh, and uh, nothing's, you know, it's, what are the Democrats, what is the, what is the, forget about Democrats. What does the deep state, what is the administrative state, what are those who abuse their powers granted to them by the American people? None of them have been prosecuted. Now, maybe something will happen. And uh, I think a lot of the kookaball activity is as a result for fear of prosecution, however slight. Uh, so, uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, there's always a possibility you get a prosecution. But unless someone's prosecuted, uh, the Republicans aren't going to change their stripes unless there's a radical change in leadership attitude. And I, you know, when you hear these radio ads uh, at the end of the radio about for financial products, you know, they quickly say at the end of the ad, you know, past performance is no indication right. of future success or right. future, future right, right, where there's always a risk. Well, actually, in politics, it's the opposite. Past performance is an indication of what will happen in the future. And it, you can expect more of the same. And what's the X factor? people like President Trump, which is why he's so despised in this town. He fired Comey. He fired Sessions. Frankly, I think the Sessions firing was more significant than the Comey firing in the sense that uh, if not for that, we'd still have the Mueller operations sniffing around trying to figure out what they, they could do to keep on harassing the president and drive him from office. So those are the sorts of positive things that can happen when you have individual leadership like the president's shown on some of these corruption issues. You're, you're making me a little bit depressed because you talk about the individual leadership of the president, the willingness to fight back, and I admire that about him. He never strikes first. He always hits back. And that's what people don't seem to understand. You call him a Nazi, you call him a Nazi, he calls you a jerk, and all the pearls are clutched across the media going, can you believe he called Jim Acosta a jerk? Like, yeah, did you not pay attention to what Jim Acosta did? The Republican Party is so used to fighting by the Marcus of Queensbury rules in a street fight. They will get hit in the face and then go apologize for possibly hurting the guy who hit them's hand. It's that level of insanity. And you're depressing me in the fact that you're saying that you don't think the party is learning that fighting back is the better strike. You just take the punch and apologize. Well, you know, look, I'm describing the state of the world. And Judicial Watch doesn't rely on the Republican Party, doesn't rely on Congress, doesn't rely on any administration to do the right thing in terms of transparency or upholding the rule of law. We have expectations that they do the right thing, but if we relied on them, we would be shut down. So my position is that we're just going to keep on doing the work we're doing because you know, we can bemoan whether the Republicans are or are not doing what they should be doing or complain about what the Democrats are or aren't doing. But in the end, it's up to us. And so what Judicial Watch is, is we're a grassroots group. We've got support of millions of Americans across the country, one of the most widely supported groups in the, in the country right now in terms of public policy. And we're just doing the basic work that Congress doesn't want to do and the administration resists, the deep state agencies, and frankly, some of his appointees resist. And, uh, and, and thankfully, we have a, a still the, the, the elements, the core elements of the rule of law that allow us to go into court and be, and be on equal footing with these government agencies and get them to give us the documents. How is Judicial Watch received as an organization and you by those people you're talking about? I imagine you walk in and there's secretary so-and-so and, -so and uh, he calls you a so-and-so under his breath. They, they curse the existence. I mean, one of the, the good things about an organization that differentiates an organization from other organizations is that you get under the skin of whoever's in power. Journalists, again, used to do that, too. But now it's it's groups like Judicial Watch, the Freedom of Information Act requests. The, why do these people think they can get away with it, first of all? Because they have for so long? Well, the Justice Department is run by liberal partisans, mm -hmm. and they defend the indefensible and the illegal secrecy by all the other agencies, including themselves. So unless that changes, uh, that's that's the challenge we face. How, why, how do people think about Judicial Watch? I think... Uh, the people you well, expose or well, potentially it, ask for information there are from. Two, there are two groups of people. There are people who fear and admire us, usually. <laughs> it, it goes hand in hand. They... Admire our work, but we make them a little bit nervous because they don't know 
well, what are they going to ask me about? Because you know, we ask tough questions of both parties. And uh, on the left, um, they see an effective organization who they kind of hate because of our effectiveness, but admire and want to mimic. And uh, almost every two or four years, you see a spate of stories saying, you know, how the left is trying to come up with alternatives to Judicial Watch. Uh, because there's no one on the left as effective as, as Judicial Watch in prying loose information from the government and and actually educating people about what we find. And because, look, you know, we're a public interest group, and the public's interest isn't served if the public doesn't know about what we're doing. So there are a lot of there are a lot of people out there on the left, and you know, there are some honest liberals out there who want to make sure the government isn't lying and is trying are trying to get documents. Uh, but too often, their their fines are even. I held up. And uh, and it's interesting on the deep state, you get people who have been skeptical on the left of the national security state uh, who are sympathetic to our efforts to uncover what went on and the abuses of Donald Trump, uh, as opposed to kind of the more partisans who don't care what happens as long as it gets the guy they don't like. On the issue of transparency, is it getting harder or easier? Um, you know, to get answers to, to basic questions. Freedom, anybody can file a Freedom of Information Act request, but you have, it's an art form to get the information you're looking for, to get information that's relevant to what you're searching for, because the people who fulfill them go, oh, they didn't dot that I, or they didn't cross that T, or they didn't put a, a comma in there so we can interpret it a different way. Is it getting worse in your 20 years at Judicial Watch to get transparency regardless of the party that's in power? Or is it getting better? Uh, it's gotten worse. And you know who ruined it? Hillary Clinton. Her email scheme and the withholding of that those emails and the conspiracy with all those emails just kind of blew up the whole litigation, uh, litigation surrounding FOIA and the way agencies handle Freedom Information Act requests. Uh, it used to be uh, you asked for the documents, you didn't get them, you sued, and you just tried to get to a place where you got the documents you could get, you fought over the withholdings, and the government, you know, you know, you just, you know, there was an interest in trying to get the information out. I mean, there was there was always lawless objections to it, and you fought it, uh, but once Hillary did what she did, the government fought us on every step where in the past they didn't necessarily fight us as hard as they used to. So now the agencies are so hyper aware of FOIA, it's resulted in in uh, having to sue to get the time of day. And the way Hillary's emails were discovered, there was a Freedom of Information Act request looking for emails relative to something and yeah. from Hillary Clinton, and there were no emails. And like, hey, that's weird. Why aren't there any emails from Hillary Clinton? Does she not email? And then they found out, and the rest is sort of history. They found out, wait a second, yeah. she doesn't operate on these servers. Yeah, that's what happened. We would ask for, we, it's funny, we had asked for Benghazi material. We had noticed there were no Hillary Clinton emails, and we're like, well, maybe we didn't ask the right way. Let's ask again. And of course, we got the runaround, so we sued. And then we, you know, then they were keep on playing games, and our lawyers pushed back and said, "Where? what's going on here? And then finally, in the first part, I think it was 2015 or 14, I think it was 2015, they told the court, we gave Judicial Watch everything we could, except for these other documents. And then, lo and behold, the leak comes out in the New York Times a few weeks later, Clinton emails. So, I mean, FOIA exposed to Clinton. Look, if it weren't for Judicial Watch, we wouldn't know about the Clinton emails. It's, It's a fact. It's a fact. We'd have President Hillary Clinton. Certainly it changed the course of history. I mean, we, I, I didn't think Hillary was going to be running for president. So when we were asking for these documents, we had no idea what the consequences would be as a result of the cover-up being exposed. We didn't even know about the high, hidden Clinton emails for sure at the time. Uh, but um, there was accountability on Election Day. Uh, you know, certainly she wasn't uh, indicted criminally. But, you know, if the American people were sitting as a grand jury, they sure as heck indicted her on Election Day. In this whole witch hunt mess, is there, in your mind, hope that anybody will be indicted criminally? I mean, you've got the powers of the spying apparatus of the United States that are supposed to be directed outward, directed inward toward Carter Page, who was portrayed as a potential foreign agent, a spy, never been charged, walking free right at this moment. 
But that was used as the camel's nose under the tent to then spy on the Trump campaign as a whole and maybe even the Trump administration. There's no doubt that it was, even if the origins were as pure as the wind-driven snow, that it eventually, there came a point when you're spying on Carter Page where you have to realize that he's not a Russian agent and they should have, by law, pulled back. Somebody said, screw it, keep going, spread that circle, get me more information, keep going forward. I assume with the idea that Hillary would win, so this would never be uncovered anyway, but while we're here, let's look around. Is there a possibility in your mind that anybody will be held accountable, a Brennan, a Comey, a, maybe on up to the president, because I can't imagine that his national security apparatus being turned inward was not at least brought up with the man? Well, there's a chance. I mean, because before, before a few weeks ago, I would have said, look, there's no indication of a criminal investigation. Now reports have confirmed there's a criminal investigation, which is, despite all the noise about Ukraine and the coup and, and the attack on President Trump, uh, which is just terrible, absolutely terrible, the biggest headline is we have confirmation from the Justice Department that there's evidence of crimes in the spying on President Trump. So that the spying was not, there's evidence that there was criminal activity tied to the decisions to spy on the president, uh, then candidate Trump, his people, and who knows who else. So, uh, so now there's a slight chance that there'll be prosecutions. But, you know, we, we can't say it enough right now. This is what the coup's about. They know there's potential criminal prosecutions tied to the spying on Trump world. And we have the DOJ confirming there's evidence of crimes in terms of the targeting of President Trump. The president is a crime victim. And now he's a victim of a civil rights violation like no one other with by Adam Schiff and people like that. It's not even just Congress and the impeachment investigation, the investigation looking at used to be there's a crime. We have to figure out who did it. Now, here's a person. Let's figure out if they committed a crime. You have the Southern District of New York. You Still have, harassing him. Still harassing they, him. The attorney general of the state of New York essentially was elected on the promise that I will go after Trump about whatever we'll figure out later. But I will go after Trump. Again, this to me strikes me as as the the, the watershed moment. This I don't know how we can pull back from this if the people who are doing this don't look in the mirror and go, "My God, what have we become?" Because we're there saying, "My God, what have you become?" And they don't see it. So the only rational response is to sort of hold them to their own medicine. Should the positions be reversed? Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to put people in jail just because I don't like them. Mm -hmm. I just want a serious criminal investigation and a prosecution, if the facts and the evidence warrant it. It was like with Hillary Clinton. I, whether she goes to jail, you know, I don't know, but I do want a criminal investigation unmarred by the politics and corruption of the Obama administration that was protecting her and breaking all the rules to cover up what she did. I, mean, what, I just want justice to work a little bit. I mean, I'm, I, you know, my standards aren't as high as people think. I just, you know, can we get the system to work at all? Just, or is it completely broken? Is it completely broken? Is That's it completely the broken? You're the one who would know. Well, You're on the inside it, of it. I you tell you, if you ask the president, it's completely broken. It's absolutely broken. You have a malicious, seditious conspiracy targeting the president of the United States. And, you know, and, it, and, and um, I was listening to Rush Limbaugh the other day. He made the point. Remember, the president is a temporary figure. He will eventually not be in office. And remember what they're really attacking. They're attacking our system. They're attacking the vote, every voter, not just Trump voters. But, you know, if you think your vote is supposed to count for or against a candidate, ha, you got another thing coming as far as these deep state mandarins are concerned because they think they should be running the show. And, and the voters who actually vote for president, huh, who cares what they think? If you vote against the president, it doesn't matter because we're running the show, not the voters. So this is a core issue about the future of our republic. Who's going to be running the show? The voters, the people? Will we have self-government anymore or not? That's kind of the issue of dealing with Ukraine and all foreign policy. It's clear that the foreign policy establishment doesn't like the president and don't want to implement his agenda. 
And that's kind of how this Ukraine mess did. These so-called experts think they know better than the president of the United States. And rather than trying to convince them and accepting that they don't, they didn't. And the president wants to go in a different direction despite their best efforts. They then decided to kneecap him. And that's a dangerous precedent. Uh, the president should call the Ukrainians back and make sure they're actually doing an investigation. <laughs> Joe Biden, he's... Uh, do you think Joe Biden may? I, I'm not going to ask you a political question, <laughs> but um, I don't know who's going to win next year. I don't know if it's going to be Hillary Clinton or President Trump. <laughs> there you go. Lastly, what can we expect next week at these hearings and what can we look forward to in the near future from Judicial Watch if you want to tease anything? <clears throat> oh, we have documents coming out about what topics I, I can't tell you. I there's figured. always you something. There's me. always something coming. Um, I think the hearings next week, uh, it will just be dependent on your point of view. If you think they're a show trial, you're going to have one point of view. Uh, if you think uh, the president did something wrong, you're going to have another. Is there a risk? I think that- factually speaking, it's it's completely abuse. It's an abuse of power and it's just going to be more evidence of it. In the bowels of the Capitol, Adam Schiff was allowed to rule like a Roman emperor. He could decide what was going on. He still technically can on the rules, but politically, if a Republican is seen as asking a legitimate line of question that makes Adam Schiff uncomfortable, and he steps in to to stop it, to overrule it, like God from Mount Olympus, like Zeus coming down with a lightning bolt, I think there's a possibility that the the sunlight is going to be a great disinfectant here if he conducts himself the way he has been in private. Well, the transparency, however corrupt and selective, is always useful. You're better off knowing information as opposed to just guessing about what went on in these hearings or these uh, depositions, however abusive and unfairly worded the president. And uh, I think looking at the glass half full view of this is that the last few weeks have been very interesting. The, Rep- the Democrats, the coup cabal has been put back on their heels a little bit. I don't think they plan the release of transcripts. I don't think they plan for an impeachment inquiry vote. I don't think they planned on public hearings. Uh, this, these are all defensive maneuverings because they fear uh, that the, uh, the president's defenders' arguments about the rule of law and fundamental fairness and constitutionality are taking hold with enough members and enough members of the public to warrant these feints towards uh, due process, these feints towards transparency. We were originally promised, over by, we want this over by Thanksgiving. Now they've already punted that. So maybe maybe you're right. I, you know, look, they, their goal is to impeach the president. Uh, the, the, the feints towards, as I say, there are feints. They're fit uh, towards transparency and due process. Um, are, are, uh, they're not going to let anything get in the way of impeaching this president. And that's why I think the firewall needs to be built at the Senate to try to uh, uh, take the wind out of the sails of the uh, momentum the Democrats are trying to keep uh, towards abusing their powers to uh, uh, institute what I think is an unconstitutional coup against the president of the United States. And you will be there and Judicial Watch will be there. Yeah, to hold know. them accountable. Maybe I'll go to the hearing the and whole get a thing. seat. I don't know. <laughs> Sitting back. You can sit right next to Medea Benjamin, who Code Pink will probably stand I'll, up I'll, and scream. I will, bear no. wit- I will bear witness to the attack on the Constitution. Tom least- Pitton. Thank you for coming. Hey, thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. Judicialwatch.org. That's right. Is the website. Everybody check it out. Everybody click subscribe, share, and send this to friends. And uh, we'll see you back here with a whole nother show on Monday. Have a great weekend.